Hi, I'm Randall Davis from the University of Utah, the English Language Institute. And I'm happy to be with you today, not live, but hopefully this could be a very beneficial presentation to you on Flipgrid plus smartphones equals effective assessment. And feel free to contact me using my email. You'll see that right there in the middle of the screen. Well, the objective of today's presentation is to demonstrate how a service like Flipgrid can be used in conjunction with other devices that you might have to carry out formal and informal assessment. And some of the objectives are to discuss the challenges of assessing student speaking skills in no matter what class, demonstrate how Flipgrid works from a student's perspective, point of view, and from a teacher's, and to share a variety of different tasks that could be used in conjunction with it. So if I were to ask teachers, what are some of the challenges they have to, in facing their you know, assessment needs in the classroom, their speaking skills of students, I, there would probably be a number of traditional challenges. Number one, having limited time with large classes. I mean, how do you go about assessing a class of 100 students or 50 students, which is not uncommon? Not having an efficient means of recording students at all. I mean, yeah, a lot of times people are thinking about using smartphones but what about your, if you're working with students in a low resource environment? Very difficult. The other thing is finding ways of providing meaningful feedback for students to be able to listen to the recording and then reflecting on their speech pronunciation and production. And the last thing is, what competencies do I evaluate? How do I evaluate grammar? How do I evaluate strategic competency where a student is using circumlocution to repair their conversation, cultural competency, and pronunciation. So all of those are just challenges in any classroom. The other idea with technology is that you have to keep several things in mind. Pedagogy, what methods am I going to be using? Rationale, what is the rationale behind using technology and different tools in the first place? And the next thing is technology. What technologies do I select and use? And I think a very blended approach will probably be a key to any of this type of assessment. So uh, one particular quote in relationship to this is, technology presumes there's only one uh, right way to do things, and there never is. I mean, the reality is just because you have a technology and just because you can do something with technology, or a smartphone doesn't mean it should be done either. So I often think about the less is more principle. In other words, years ago, we used to have this blender. It had 12 speeds. We just wanted to make a smoothie. But when you look at the buttons, grind, and chop, and shred, and cream, and liquefy, and whip, what's the difference between all of those? They all seem to do the same thing. And that happens a lot with technology as well, where someone suggests a technology and you could do 2,500 things with it when you only need the technology to do two. So when I think of technology, I think of the less is more principle, all right? In other words, I need a blender that turns on and off, on and off. In other words, you should think of a technology or the tools within that technology and select those that are really going to support your learning. In other words, if you have a technology or computer lab that can do 2,500 things, maybe you should learn how to do two of those very well. So as we talk about Flipgrid, I promise you there are many, many things that can be done, but I'm just gonna focus on the basic principles and certainly you can explore those on your own. Again, on-off principle. So at the University of Utah, we've gone through an evolution of different assessment methods. Starting about 20 years ago, we used to do teacher to student interviews, pair conversations. Later on, we purchased a couple different lab systems over the years, but we found that sometimes they were cumbersome. Sometimes they didn't always function in the way that we wanted. And then in 2010 to 2018, 
We used a service called Google Voice. It's free in the United States, a great service re re for recording in conjunction with the computer labs. And then later on, we switched to Flipgrid. The nice thing is some of you probably heard of Google Voice. It's still available. It's a great technology using smartphones. One of the challenges about doing this is that it had a three minute limit and the picture you see is, is of students actually doing a speaking assessment in class. It was only available in the US. Uh, you couldn't really save your recordings very easily and there was limited methods of providing feedback. So that's where Flipgrid comes into play. And Flipgrid originally was designed as kind of a video discussion platform where teachers could post an idea and then students using their smartphones could respond to it, comment on it, uh, come comment on each other's videos. It was a great service. And I shouldn't say was because it still exists. And one of the significant changes happened in 2018 when Microsoft purchased Flipgrid. Back then, I think it was like $60 a year. It was a great service, but beyond many teachers' uh, budget levels. And the nice thing about Microsoft reaching in and acquiring Flipgrid is that you know that this particular service will continue to be supported into the future. And uh, this idea of a big company like Microsoft you think about it's going to be supported, it's going to be sustained, and so forth. So uh, a couple of ideas, even though in the presentation I'm talking about smartphones and Flipgrid, actually Flipgrid can be used with computers, it can be used with Macs, PCs, Chromebooks, iPads, any type of device can be used with it. So one of the things that I want to show here, and this is the challenge in any presentation, is not to overload the, those that are watching the presentation because with Flipgrid, just like any service, it has many features that I never even touch. Also, I'm going to be showing some, uh, a combination of screenshots as well as I'm gonna take you through a, a tutorial on the website. And just keep in mind that as you watch a video like this, with Flipgrid, they're constantly adding new features. They're changing a little bit of the layout and the way it looks. So what you see today might not be what you see tomorrow, but the functionality basically and the appearance looks the same. So basically, Flipgrid, Flipgrid works like this. Teachers open account and they create a speaking activity like Deserted Island. Then the students will go into the grid. And again, grid is like a class. They'll go into class and they'll use their, like I said, mobile phones, smartphones, iPads, uh, webcam like I'm using right now. And we'll, we'll record a response to that prompt. And then what they will do is they will submit their video response and then the teacher can pr provide feedback in different ways. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. All right, so let's start with some basic screenshots. So imagine that a student has downloaded the Flipgrid app. Again, we're gonna talk about the student experience, then the teacher's experience. Uh, they go through the installation, they allow their camera, they allow their microphone. The view on an Android phone is similar. Then I'm going to talk about this in a few minutes. There are different ways in which students can access the grid, uh, different ways. Um, and this is one way where a teacher assigns each student an actual, um, if you look at here, let me just go ahead and circle the, uh, an ID code. And this is the flip code that could be considered the class code. That could be anything you want as long as it's still available. Now, one of the things I wanna keep in mind here is, and I'm gonna talk about this in a few minutes, that a teacher can actually, rather than assigning each student an individual code like Juanita Gomez and Tomoko Suzuki, you can really create just student. And then later on in a few minutes, I can show you where the student, once they submit it, they can actually type in their name. Uh, in other words, you're using a generic code for all of the students. This would be very useful if you have like 80 students. 
But in example of a small class, you would create, again, a code uh, for students so they can access the grid. After that, then what they would do, again, that is the class code. Then they would enter the code. Again, the one way I showed you just a minute ago was to access the code, access the class. The student can also go to a screen where they will enter the code instead of using the a QR code. They enter that uh, class code right there. Then they will enter their uh, student ID. Let's say it's 001 or whatever you want it to be. Again, I used to assign each student their own name and their own number, but then I realized, well, that's possible. But if you have a lot of students, instead, you can just have everyone has student and 001 or whatever. And then when they save it, then they can indicate their real names. This is just showing a slightly different way. So let me just go ahead and erase that right there. Okay. Then once they go in, the students on their phone would read the situation like this. Then after they read the situation, then they would actually cl click the green button. Now, uh, let me point out something that is changing. When I first started using Flipgrid, the recording time was 15 seconds to five minutes. Five minutes, I think, was great, great for individual recordings. But if I was doing a pair recording, in other words, a student had a single phone and they sat the phone in front of them and they were recording them and a partner, uh, five minutes was kind of short. Now, Flipgrid recently has up, uh, upgraded, you could say, increased the recording time to 15 minutes, which is really nice, let's say, for class presentations. Once they do that, then they would click on the record button. The student re record themselves. Uh, this example right in the middle is what it looks like on an Android phone. And there are many learning possibilities. Let me just share this right now while I'm on this screen. Because when you think about possibilities, you can think about pair work. You can think about, wow, a puppet show. Uh, you could do pronunciation practice, oral testing, debates. There's so many possibilities with Flipgrid. And I'm thinking in my classes, number one, I use it for pronunciation practice where students read sentences. And also I might do them for like individual recordings and assessments. So uh, then the student can actually listen to their recording. After they listen to the recording, they can actually, uh, well, this is called live flipping. And the live flipping is, you see in the yellow right there, it has like a little flip button. And what that is, is if you wanted, for example, to you know, record you and a partner and you wanted to flip back and forth, which is not very you know, helpful. I mean, you could hold a phone and record yourself next to each other. But let's say you're talking about some scenic, uh, landscape or the mountains or whatever, you can flip the camera so it's pointing that way as you're recording. So that's called live flipping. All right, so let's go on then. Then afterwards, you would take a selfie, all right? The actual picture that you record with the selfie is what this teacher will see in their account. Then you can save your, uh, you can uh, save the recording and save it, you can save it to your phone and it will save to the actual teacher's account as well. So these are some of the basic ways in which you can use Flipgrid. At the end, it says, hey, you, do you wanna save your response? And then you can return back to the topic if you want. All right, well, that's kind of a brief overview of what the student will see, but what about the teacher? Well, let's take a look at this. Now, there are many ways of creating grids. Uh, I mean, there's just many ways. And when it says grid code, that's just the class code. Student ID number, that's the ID number that a student gets into the, the grid. And again, I don't want to focus a lot of time on this, but there are many ways. You see my classroom or school connects with students in that way. Student ID list, I use that. It, I think it's a really easy way if you're working independently at your own school, you're not, you're not working with some type of uh, content-based management system, learning system with your school. So there are different ways, and I would take a look at what method 
works best for you. Uh, this is an example where I often use in the past. I'm currently using a content management system with our university called Canvas. Some of you probably heard that. And uh, so I don't use this method right now. Students actually access the at class activities through Canvas. But this method, student ID list, is probably the simplest way. Let's say that you're working independently, uh, you're a private teacher, or you're working with a class that doesn't rely on university resources, uh, like a content management system. This is one of the easiest ways to do it, where you would actually type in each student's name, and give them a, an ID, whatever that ID is, and then it will print out a QR code that students can use to access the grid. And again, we're going to look at that. This is an example of the cards that it prints out. Well, let's take a look at this. I think I would rather like to go into the actual website. All right, so let's take a look. So imagine that you created a grid. Again, you can you know, use any grid name as long as it's available. Again, a grid is your class. And then inside the grid, then you create new topics or activities. So here is one example. Let's just say, you say, you know, pronunciation, uh, practice, uh, number one or something like that. Then under that, then you would write whatever you want, you know, whatever the prompt is, whatever you want students to do, whether it's read sentences, reply to a, a speaking prompt or whatever. Uh, next, what you can do is select the time. Again, it used to be up to five minutes, but now it's 10, uh, 10 minutes. I'm sorry. I think I said 15 earlier, but it's actually to 10 minutes, not 15. Uh, which is a lot of extra time there. The next thing is video moderation. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of the features, but usually when I do grids, this is what I usually do them for. All right, number one, Flipgrid was designed so that you could create a prompt and all of the students see each other's video responses, which is great because, you know, they can respond to each other. They can comment comment on each other's videos, a great way of doing that. However, what I often do it, I use it for testing. In other words, I want students to submit a video to me, but I don't want the other students to see it. I'm only using it for testing. That's where I turn video moderation on. Again, that's so that students create the recording, great for testing, only you see those videos. You can also add some additional resources like upload an image. Let's say you want students to respond to a picture of a beautiful landscape, okay? And then you could add a, a, a picture there. And there are other things that you can add. You can see all of the possibilities. I haven't used all of these, but certainly something to explore. And it looks like they're adding something new all the time. Um, next is you can, for example, uh, deal with status you can deter determine is this activity open or closed you can make it active uh, you can make it active to a certain date you can choose a date when the activity opens and closes uh, there are many other video features here as well you can look at these uh, whether students like or dislike whether students can reply to each other uh, video trimming so a lot of dis different possibilities but the focus that I mentioned in my original part of the presentation was on assessment. So the reason why I'm not focusing on these and going back to this moderation uh, button up here is that we're speaking on assessment, assessment. So let me go down here to the actual assessment tools. Now, there are different ways that you can do this assessment. Number one, it has basic feedback where already, you know, it says ideas and performance. Those are the things that you want students to, you know, to receive feedback on. But what you can also do is you can do custom feedback. In other words, did the student answer the question? And then you can click open this button and then you can decide, well, what score are you going to give them? Now, this is going back to the idea of uh, criteria and making sure that whatever criteria and assessment you use, it is clear to the student. 
So again, you could be on fluency, you could be checking grammar, ideas, and you can add a new criteria, whatever the criteria that you want it to be. And I also, I guess I usually encourage teachers to say, okay, here's you know, minimum score, maximum score. The challenge is, is if you choose something between one and 10 on some type of criteria, you have to be able to justify and define to students what is the difference between a five and a six or a seven and a nine. So sometimes keeping it sim simple, like a zero one or something like that is much easier to do. And those are some of the different types of feedback that you can give to students. Certainly more can be done. There's a lot more of other types of feedback and ways to do this. There are different ways of integrating this into uh, Canvas, like I mentioned before. But let me go back and wrap up this presentation by sharing with you a little bit about class setup. Now, a lot of times when I was in the class, I realized that if students had a particular recording that they were doing and they were facing each other, they quickly realized visually and, and with their ear, oh no, these three other students are finishing before I am. Oh no, and what happens is that students had a tendency to quickly end the recordings because they could see everyone else was ending as well. So what I started doing when I was using Flipgood, just like in this uh, picture right here, is I had students start looking away, facing away, uh, looking at the wall, so that although they could hear the other students finishing, they didn't have that extra visual stimulus of being worried that other students were watching them as they were recording as well. So that really, really resulted in students speaking longer. All right, and so that was really good. Uh, the other thing I think I mentioned, there are other possibilities, certainly. Uh, pronunciation tasks, presentations, now that Flipgrid is up to 10 minutes, add some possibilities there. And again, with each one of these, you want to be thinking, number one, going back to the idea of speaking assessment, number one, what is the criteria? What competencies am I going to be checking? Let's say grammar. And when I mention that rubric, the rubric allows you to, you know, give scores between zero and 100. But a lot of times, even with technologies and even with your best intentions, if you give a scale like, oh, your pronunciation, what is a six out of a 10? How are you going to define that? How are you going to say the difference between a six and a seven? So sometimes when I do flip grid activities, I do zero or a one. You know, let's say there was a key word in a sentence that I was having students record. Let's say the word, excuse me, the word was, sorry, a little cough there. The word is terrain, terrain. And so the student says, oh, the terrain is very hilly in this area. So if they pronounce the word terrain correctly, then you perhaps could give them a one or a zero. Not, oh, you got a five out of a 10 or something like that. Puppet shows, research projects, oral testing, uh, debates. Uh, there are app smashing. Uh, there, you can do app smashing where there are different apps that you can use in conjunction with each other and demonstrations. So in today's presentation, I talked a little bit about Flipgrid. I mentioned at the beginning of making sure that you combine pedagogy and the rationale for using it and technology and looking at the simplest tools that will be best to accomplish your objectives. Oh, Flipgrid can do tons of things. But one of the things that I found of most benefit is in speaking assessments. Other teachers will find other uses. But as I do and I create assessments, number one, whatever rubric I use, make sure it's simple and easy for the students to interpret and understand. And if you're doing it in the classroom, set up your classroom so that students are looking away so that they don't have that extra stress of other eyes watching them. Currently now, I am doing a lot of online classes. Students are continuing to use Flipgrid, so I don't have that issue of you know, people watching each other. But certainly Flipgrid and combining it with effective assessment certainly can change the way that you teach 
and the way that students learn and improve on their skills. Uh, that is all for today. Again, I want to thank you very much for joining this presentation. Feel free to contact me by email if you have any questions. And again, good luck on your use of Flipgrid and uh, speaking assessments.